All right, so welcome to uh, the Plant Medicine People conversation on uh, mushrooms, which is like a gigantic topic. Mushrooms are so incredibly special. They have their own classification in the organic world. They're not plants, they're not animals, they're fungi. Um, and we have with us one of my sisters near and dear, Jenny, who is one of the biggest badasses that I know. Um, <laughs> you are, lady, let me, let me give a little bit of your background. Um, you're sure. trained in Ayurvedic medicine, right? You have yeah. a background in neuroscience extensive history and relationship with mycology, which is our topic today. Yeah. Um, a, a very advanced yoga practitioner. We are super skilled in that. And you've had quite an epic journey of your own healing path. And I know this is deeply personal. So I'm gonna pass it to you to share whatever you are willing to share with us in a space of inspiration about what you've been through in your personal journey of healing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so let's talk about my journey, I guess. Um, uh, so a lot of years ago now, um, I want to say it's been about 14 years, um, I got diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And when I got the diagnosis, it was just, it was quite a shock because when you're so young, um, you know, you don't really like ever think about it being the end of your world. You kind of have this like mentality that you're invincible. Right. And so when you're told all of a sudden you're not invincible, it's, um, mentally and emotionally, um, pretty shocking. Right. And so my first reaction, of course, you know, like you, like everybody else, I imagine is to depend on the doctor to tell you what's next. Um, you know, and so I asked exactly, you know, like, what can I do? What, what is the next steps from here? How can I heal this? And his reaction was to write me a prescription for painkillers and tell me to just wait it out and, um, that they would do a whole bunch of testing to see what stage I was at. Um, but the initial testing that they had done did not look good or promising, and he told me right there that three months was his prediction for me. And so <laughs> you're like, wow, okay. Um, you got go from having the whole rest of your life ahead of you to three months, right? And I was like, that can't be the case, you know? And freaking pain pills, like if I do only have three months, I don't wanna spend the last three months of my life all doped up, that's ridiculous. And so I was like, there has to be another way, right? And so, from that, um, I never went back. I never went back to the doctor or the hospital again. And I decided I was going to take my healing into my own hands. And, you know, my thought process at the time was if I fail, screw it. Because, <laughs> you know, what, what can it really hurt? You know, it can't really mess anything up or, or make my time shorter. Right. And so um, I dove into like every type of research that I possibly could. And I started with Ayurvedic medicine. Um, and I learned a whole bunch of different things from that um, and started, you know, changing my diet, changing my habits, that kind of thing. Uh, I started yoga and um, then I just happened to chance upon Paul Stamet's lecture on mushrooms <laughs> and fell absolutely in love with, you know, the whole concept of healing with mushrooms and mushrooms became my absolute passion uh, because there are so many and so many different ways to heal. And so for me personally, I started taking turkey tail. I started taking lion's mane, chaga. I just packed in every mushroom I could pack in. Um, and it worked because here I am, you know, and they gave me three months and that was 14 years ago. So <laughs> whatever, you know, nature heals and you can't ever rely on somebody's professional opinion to tell you what's best for you or you know what I mean like in the doctor world type thing they, they really don't know they they they're not aware of the many different types of healing that are out there and when it starts with your mind um I feel like there are so many possibilities with healing and that's where the mushrooms come in um for me so personally. what's different about the mushrooms do you think so let's talk about them so, yes nature's alchemists and having their own category in organic medicine so what's what are their superpowers you know how do you view them as beings so 
I mean, mushrooms have all kinds of superpowers because there are so many different kinds, right? They're their own kingdom. So as animals are their own kingdom, think about how many animals that there are in the world, and how many different ones, you know, that you might even still not know exist. And that's the exact same idea as fungi are out in the world. You know, that's how many there are. And so obviously not every single one of them are good for you. You don't want to like be wandering around the forest, just eating all willy nilly because <laughs> you need a little, a little bit about what you're doing. Right. But, um, you know, for me, there's magic mushrooms, of course, are, you know, a category that I clump a whole bunch of mushrooms into all of the psilocybin mushrooms. And interestingly enough, not all psilocybin mushrooms even produce a hallucinogenic effect. Um, so that's a little bit interesting, but I do call them all magic mushrooms because they're- That's oh. important right there, right? That's super important yeah. because there are people that want to go on this healing journey that don't feel called to an altered state of consciousness, right? right. So it's important to emphasize that you said, even in the category of psilocybin mushrooms, there are those that don't create hallucinogenic effects. Exactly. Super healing. That's so interesting exactly. because it's important to know that um, we're not limited. It's not about the altered space that creates a healing experience, although it can help for various reasons, but it's not required. Absolutely. Fair enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the research is still rather preliminary with it all um, because of past regulations and stuff. Now, I believe it's maybe 10, 15 years that people are really starting to get back into the science behind it all. But so far, they're saying that even the psilocybin mushrooms that do not produce hallucinogenic effects actually still have the same effect on your brain as far as um, creating new neural pathways. So it, you can still definitely get the same effect, the same healing. And, you know, I bring these up because for me, I believe that they offer you, <laughs> hi, Kitty, <laughs> they <laughs> offer you the opportunity um, to do a lot of soul searching. and. To me, healing and figuring out what you need to heal in your life is a very personal thing. And so using these as a tool and having these as a tool to open up all these possibilities to yourself, to be able to go inward and, you know, really do some deep searching of where you need to heal in your life. You know, your mind, your body, everything is connected with each other. And so if you're, if you're feeling you know, not yourself mentally, it can affect you physically and vice versa, that kind of thing. And so the mushrooms offer the opportunity to view yourself in a holistic fashion so that you can take other methods of healing, such as the rest of the mushrooms in the world, because not all mushrooms are psilocybin mushrooms, right? And so I kind of clump all of the rest of these into what I call functional mushrooms. And those include like turkey tail, uh, lion's mane, chaga, reishi, like tons and tons and tons right so can i ask you a personal question and you can decline yeah. to answer it but you're talking about you know of course the very personal process of healing did you discover along the way with the help of mushrooms or any of the tools you were using for your personal journey of what the gift was of the ovarian cancer why did that come in how you know the co-creation <laughs> of it yes um so well i believe that that came um, for me, from a lot of past trauma in my life, um, that I had not, you know, I guess a lot of people probably take life this way when you're thrown into something that's traumatic or upsetting, you're taught to push it down or you're not strong, you're not tough. Right. Um, so you're like, your mentality is like, all right, well, that's in the past, you know, let's just bury it and onward with life, keep trucking on. But the reality is those things still sit there. And they sit in your gut and they affect your mind. They affect your body sometimes without you even knowing it. And so the gift of this illness really for me was to be able to learn to acknowledge all of the things in my life that needed healing and address them, you know, and the mushrooms were a tool for me to be able to address those things and come out on the other side. Um, a lot Thank more you for that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So when you say address it, how do we address it? What does that mean? You know, because we, you and I know that it's not just about taking something like a powerful mushroom and, you know, voila, I feel better. 
the right. all the plants, the entheogens in particular, they have a way of forcing us to be accountable with what we're carrying in our body, what we're repressing, you know, what what has happened to us and our relationship to it. So in your process and how you work with yourself and others, what does that addressing really look like? How do we heal? You know, what does that process look like? That's a very big question because everybody is so different. You know, everybody's needs are different. Everybody's traumas are different. Everybody's pains are different. And so everybody's healing is different. And I think that that's important to think about when you're about to start your own journey of healing is to think about, you know, what suits you. Um, because exactly like you said, these empty engines, they are a tool to be able to use, you know, and they're an amazing tool and, you know, but they're just the tool, like the healing is actually you and you have to do the work and the process of it. And for me personally, that was a lot of meditation. That was a lot of research because I like to be uh, in the know, I guess, of everything, you know, like I want to know everything that there is to know about health and, um, and it makes me feel in control of myself and in control of my life, knowing that I can do I, you know, knowing that I have the tools available to do everything possible to make myself healthy. Um, and so that might, you know, transfer to other people as well. Other people might feel that, you know, it feels good to at least feel like you're taking some of your control back in your life a little bit to, to take this medicine into your own hands and your health into your own hands. Which is something I think a lot of us are waking up to the reality that um, we can trust Western medicine to reattach a limb to help right. us <laughs> in like, you know, acute, intense trauma, but it's not really a system that's built on helping us figure out how to prevent and to heal illnesses. Right. We, I think a, a lot of it is expressed in the term allopathic. It's an allopathic medicine world. Allopathic means to attack the disease, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a whole system of attack, 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 but that doesn't work for all of us. The idea of, you know, taking chemo as an example, it doesn't resonate right. with all of us. If it does, fantastic, right. but it's not one size fits all. So I think what you're speaking to is something we're all waking up to is like, we have to be empowered in our own healing. We can't give that power to somebody in a lab coat that may be academically very intelligent, but certainly doesn't know what works for us. And it, it's, it's, it's a big wake up call, right? To say, we're responsible for knowing what our bodies need and what we feel called to in our healing journey. And there's so much pressure. Like, did you feel pressure from the people around you when you were choosing non, you know, Western, like traditional methods were people concerned. So interestingly, I did not really share with a lot of people what was going on in my life because of Art. that, you know, in particular, um, and similar with giving birth. Um, I just did that natural in my home by myself, you know, and that's what I wanted. And so that like mindset though, goes exactly with the healing process of anything. If you really want to do something, you have to believe in your convictions enough to move forward with it regardless of what people say but it is super helpful to just tell a select few that you know are going to be supportive of you like I told my sister and she was there she's sending me articles she's sending me books she's you know su suggesting all of these things she's being an outlet for me to talk to um, an outlet for me to process my experiences with was really really helpful and um, and that goes you know with the medicine and without, you know, you, you need somebody to talk to and lean on and feel not alone as you go through your healing. So that was, but I honor important. your discernment. You know, you are also obviously really selective to not share it with the masses that would judge and yeah. try to maybe yeah. influence your, that, that was, that was probably a big aspect of your healing journey to be discerning about mm -hmm. sharing what you're going through and making sure you had people that were going to support you and not just argue that you shouldn't do it that way because that hurts well, absolutely That's trauma. and it, it hurts and it also puts fear it plants fear into your mind you know like if you go into something and you know something in your gut is the right way to do something for yourself and then you have 10 people around you telling you no 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 you're crazy this is you're going to die this and that then you know whether you want it to affect you or not it does we're human you know and so if if you can avoid people planting fear in your heart i feel like 
there's a lot better of a chance to do your healing on your own because we all are on this journey together in a certain way, but we're all in it on our own too. We're on our own journeys. We're on our own paths, our own healing, you know, and it's important to feel your own strength. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful message and reminding all of us to support each other in doing things in a personal way around healing and, and spiritual path as a whole that maybe we don't agree with, but that we honor each other's sovereignty. It's like, yes, mm -hmm. I mean, it's our lives, our path, and to reclaim that and to support each other and that is actually really healing instead of trying to say, no, you should do it this way. Everybody's got opinions about the healing right. journey, about being a parent, about all, and if we could just let each other be sovereign, that would create a much more healing container in our culture than insisting that it, it be our way. So that, right, that was, right. I think, super smart of you to be discerning. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just a, just a quick call out to everyone listening. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to take questions too. So if you want to put anything in the chat that you would love for us to discuss, um, please inspire us. We, we would love to get your questions uh, in this too. But let's bring it back to our mushy friends. Were, do you feel like they were the ones that were most pivotal in your healing journey? Are these the, the beings that helped you alchemize what was in you? I do, absolutely. Um, because it gave me the opportunity to see myself in a holistic way. Um, and I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, you know, when you go on these journeys and you take your meditation time. I took a lot of time alone, you know, um, with this experience and a lot of going inwards. And it gives you the opportunity to look at things differently and to problem solve in a different way and to address things without fear and more creativeness, if that makes sense, you know. And so I definitely attribute, you know, my healing to the mushies, um, you know, they certainly weren't the only tool. And I don't say, oh, I took them and I'm just magically healed, you know, <laughs> like it doesn't work like that. But they they opened the door to all of the possibilities of healing that there are out there. And I picked and choose the ones that worked for me and it worked. <laughs> I love that um, the limitless sort of feeling that you're bringing in that they give us is, is yeah. I think the most important reframe is to know that healing is possible that it's possible so they came in it feels like and gave you that awareness that yes you can heal because if we don't believe that as a fundamental foundation for what we're working with well then like you know it's a shaky foundation so you right, felt the, the, that expansion <laughs> that possibility and at the same time we know we can't guarantee it we can't guarantee right. because maybe it's our soul's journey to transition in this way. We're going to transition someday, right. no matter what, you know, right. But um, I find working with the entheogens gives us peace around that no matter what. Right. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, at least we get to try. So Absolutely. yeah. Did you want to comment on that, please? Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's just funny that, you know, you said the exact same thing, but it gives you an acceptance of regardless of the outcome. Um, I, I did have a lot of peace about either way. But, you know, still the determination that everybody wants to live as long as they can, right? <laughs> but, but most of us. Had, <laughs> you know, for the, for the most part, right? And um, so, but it is interesting that it does, without even trying, it gives you an acceptance and a peace about whatever's after, you know, it's just kind of, all right, this, this is my journey. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so Vila is asking if you would share any of the specifics around the protocols that you did work with, like where she's asking, did you find info from other people that had also healed something similar and were inspired by that? Or was it mostly <laughs> intuitively guided? So it was actually a little bit of both. Um, and you can actually watch um, Paul Stamat's latest lecture from 2019. I can't remember what it's called but I'm sure you can Google it, YouTube it, but he actually had on there um, two individuals that originally the research was meant for end of life, um, you know, acceptance really. Um, and so they were using the psilocybin to accept the fact that they had stage four cancer. And both of those people were alive on there to tell the story. And so it kind of, it, you know, it opens your mind to be like, okay, well, you know, and then the same, um, same circumstance with his mother recovering from breast cancer. Um, 
using mushrooms. Um, she didn't use psilocybin, but used turkey tail along with a different medication, which I cannot remember the name of, but um, again, you can Google it. Um, so it was a little bit of inspiration from that of when you do see other people, it is working for other people, you know, there, there are possibilities of healing. And then it just reaffirms what your intuition is already telling you. That's why I honor so much that you have the courage and willingness to share your story is because it will inspire the same in other people of, ah, it's possible, <laughs> which is that spark, right? That opens us yeah. up to pursuing what we feel like might be the, the, the space where we can heal. So I love right. that though, that even the acceptance of the inevitable transition did not create it. It created the opportunity to heal because mm -hmm. sometimes just accepting <laughs> we're mortal, we're human uh, is enough to allow something to alchemize so that you know we, we can stay longer, we can play, but that's right. really, really beautiful. <laughs> um, Vila also wants to know like at what point you started to notice a difference in your healing. Like when did you know it was happening? Do you happen so, to remember that? Yes, a little bit. So that's an interesting question. Um, so like I said, I didn't go back to the doctor, um, but what I did do is I learned how to read blood reports myself, which is not terribly hard. Um, I went to Quest Diagnostics and just got my blood checked for the white blood cell count and um, to see if everything was kind of normal. And so that was about uh, six months after um, I had started my little healing journey and I was still around. So I was like, I wonder if it's working. <laughs> so I went and I checked that and actually my blood levels were all normal. Um, and so that was the first clue to me that yes, everything is great, you know? And so I just kept going with it. Um, and how did that feel? You, how did that feel that moment you're looking at? Wait a second, <laughs> blood levels are normal. Like it was wild to me it really was i had to double check myself um i have a friend that does that for a living and so i sent it to him and i was like will you just make sure that i'm not crazy um and you know he came back with yeah everything's great everything looks normal um and you know he didn't know my story or anything like that i hadn't shared anything so he wasn't really biased towards looking for anything in particular um but yeah i mean that moment it was just such elation and kind of like ha huh, you know like screw that doctor <laughs> <laughs> we get to feel that even though the doctor yeah, meant right? no harm just like no, his programming exactly, no. but he was, he so was you never went back too. to a, you never went back to officially get the remission any of that like you just I trusted not. your journey um yep i trusted my journey and so one other thing that finally did affirm that the tumors were gone completely um which you know we'll talk about again as kind of like something bad happening to result in something good um a few years after this i had an ectopic pregnancy and i didn't know that i was pregnant nothing like that and i was in the middle of nowhere in washington so i waited until i almost died and this is one of those things where it is nice to have a doctor and a surgeon because <laughs> they were able to scoop me up and save me and um I asked the, the surgeon then, you know, if they saw anything, because I was curious after the fact, you know, after they fixed me all up from the ectopic pregnancy. And she was like, no, everything looks fine. And um, you just have damage to the, the fallopian tube, which, you know, might cause you to never have a child, this and that, um, which was interesting. It was a whole nother journey of healing for me started at that point. But it was it was a bittersweet thing because knowing that the tumors were gone at that point and having confirmation from a medical professional at that point uh, was kind of just extra affirming that everything that I was doing was working. Um, and then, so I started another healing journey and now I have a beautiful little girl. So, <laughs> which you birthed by yourself in your home. I which did, is like, you what? know, so don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do anything. <laughs> Amen, sister. You're, you are living proof. Um, okay, we have another really good question from Amber. She wants to know, basically, she says, if you believe that X marks the spot for trauma, you know, that basically the body is holding on to the things that happen. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you believe it was that part of your body that became affected? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And like, how yes. do, you, do you feel like the body that there's a story in that? that where it is that it shows up, there's meaning? I do, um, at least for me personally, I can't speak for everyone else. Um, 
But for me, my trauma when I was younger was sexual abuse. And so it, I did find it interesting in a way that my, um, all of my, all of my issues have been in that area, you know, and causing me to um, be ill in that part of my life. And so it was, you know, it's definitely, definitely eye opening to see the connections of wherever you're sick in your mind does show up in your body. Um, I do believe that I really do. So me too. It takes some healing. <laughs> me too. Although I always am, am very tender with that, that we not blame ourselves for the correlation right. between the relationship of right. our trauma right. and what happens. Right. Cause it's not our fault. Like certainly and, and a lot of times us. it's unconscious. Absolutely. A lot of yeah. times, it, you know, you don't even realize it's happening, but if you take the time to examine it, um, using whatever tool you feel is appropriate for you, I do believe that you can find the correlation for yourself personally and figure out how to fix it. And I know that's one of your superpowers in working with people is like just helping to find the story that the body is telling without blame, yeah. without shame, with curiosity exactly. so that, yeah, we can be empowered to do something about it, you know, but it's not our fault. But at the same time, exactly. when we know that we co-created it, then, then we bring back the power to heal it, which is amazing. exactly, exactly. It's like you said, once you realize that, I mean, it's not like you were the cause of it at all, you know, um, I'm not saying that, but when you realize the correlation, it is exciting and empowering to be like, all right, well, if that's the possible cause, then I can change that. I can fix that, you know, <laughs> like I can work with that and heal it, you know, and so then you start that journey. Mm -hmm. helps to be curious about the story that's being told. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. Amber, Amber also wants to know if you had any other spiritual allies that you work with in your healing, like, you know, uh, tr spiritual tribe members, so to speak. Um, so what, do, I, what exactly do you mean? I'm not quite sure. Guardian angels, beings on the other side, oh, like okay. animal totems. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So yes. Um, I, I, you know, identify as pagan. And so my gods are personal to me, I guess. It's not really um, anything that is labeled or named um, in any sort of organized religion. But it's something that, you know, I have seen and experienced and felt personally in my own life. Um, and so, you know, when I pray, when I meditate, it's to the unnamed really <laughs> you know we'll just call it that but yeah i do believe that there is something that's really <laughs> beautiful because what you're describing is not even having to name them or have some sort of archetype it's like this deep relationship mm -hmm. with spirit with divinity yeah. that doesn't need yeah. to be in like human form is what it sounds like that's really exactly. beautiful exactly exactly and i you know it's interesting when i'm going through something that's difficult or not even difficult when there's just something that, you know, that's on my mind kind of thing. When I go out in nature, I tend to find little signs and things, you know, of whatever it is out there has my back and is supporting me kind of thing. Um, it, it's interesting when you start paying attention to the world around you. Mm -hmm. We have to let it in, but there is <laughs> support everywhere in nature. There is. In yeah, and I think part of our journey as humans is to realize how to allow ourselves access to that, to let that Absolutely. in, because Absolutely. a lot of our pain is feeling alone and that nobody understands our pain and we have to do it all by ourselves and it's not true, but but Absolutely. like you're, you're kind of expressing this as like we have to figure out what is true for us and our relationship with spirit. It, yes. it typically doesn't work it's when someone personal. tells us it's super personal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Renee is asking, can you share how you did, how you did look at things differently when working with the mushrooms, like an example of a shift in perception? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, I guess that just goes back to paying attention to the world around me a bit more, paying attention to myself. Um, my shift went from you know, a very, very negative place without, you know, trying to be negative or trying to be dark kind of thing. But, you know, I was holding on to a lot of anger and a lot of sadness, but I didn't even realize. Um, and when I started working with the mushrooms, it gave me hope first off. Um, 
it helps me find peace within myself and it helped me start noticing like noticing things in myself and I know this is a, maybe a funny thing to say but um you know a lot of people say that when they do mushrooms uh they can't look at themselves in the mirror because they see it's you know it's scary it's disfiguring this and that and that is how it started for me and towards the end of my journey it was one of my favorite things to do was to look in the mirror and get as close as I could. And I would just be like, wow, you are just beautiful. You are so powerful. Your eyes are amazing. You know, like all of these beautiful emotions coming up within you. And that was starting, like, I guess that's the best visual example that I can give of my personal healing was my actual perspective of myself changed. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything bigger <laughs> in terms of the relationship that we have as the relationship to ourselves? So what you're describing is that it's it's kind of mysterious how the entheogens do this, but they start to shift mm -hmm. us into looking at all with awe at who we are instead of yes. what we're typically doing, the judgment, the criticism. Yes. But instead you're like, look at that being <laughs> and that is there's nothing yes. more powerful than than yes. that self-love because that's then mm -hmm. that spark that gets to grow and it helps to guide us into finding what is true for us in healing of like I'm, I'm called to ayahuasca or mushrooms or whatever it is yeah. if it comes from love it's much more powerful and trustworthy than criticism and oh, so yeah. that's <laughs> magical how that happens when we start to shift and just love ourselves as we are but that I think is one of the superpowers of mushrooms and Aya and the entheogens is, yes. is like, why, why wouldn't we love our beautiful, amazing, complicated, <laughs> fantastically powerful selves? You no, know? but right. we're programmed exactly to do you are. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. It definitely yeah. changes your programming. <laughs> so um, somebody is asking, you know, there's, you're alluding several times to the dynamic nature of mushrooms, there's so many to choose from. There's such a world available. It's almost like there's a yeah. paralysis of choice because of that. <laughs> um, do you have any suggestions as a, as a foundation to start with for someone who's looking to heal lifelong depression, childhood trauma? Like, is there, you know, at least some, some sensible place to start with somebody that, that has this deep embedded trauma? Well, a sensible place to start, um, and I guess like I can't really recommend everybody go do mushrooms, but um, not for everybody. I say I say nature provides, and whatever you feel, um, whatever you feel called to, nature will be there to provide for you, and has given you plenty of plenty of choices and opportunities. And there might be a paralysis with it, but. Um, you know, your intuition, your gut will tell you which is right for you. Um, and sometimes that means finding somebody that is, you know, more experienced in one way or another to be able to, um, you know, get advice kind of thing um, on a very personal level. Somebody that knows you, somebody that knows your story and knows maybe what type of trauma you're trying to heal um, would be a great place to start is, you know, finding a connection with somebody that can guide you that way um is this part of your work as as a coach as as somebody is. that empowers people for healing yeah because i is. mean i love your answer it's like we want to find the the truth of what <laughs> we're guided to but sometimes we need help figuring that out because we have mm -hmm. the critic voice we have layers of trauma we have other people's opinions and so working with somebody mm -hmm. that has the only investment they have is helping us find our truth you know can right. be the piece that it's like you know what i'm called right. to work with psilocybin or I'm called to work with ayahuasca right. or whatever it is, right. but there is no like going, formula. Exactly. And going to someone that you know won't judge you kind of thing too. It's just, it, that's a great place to start for healing because then you can open up and just be exactly what you are with somebody that's genuinely wants to help see you be your magical self, <laughs> you know, as oh, opposed to, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and this goes without saying, but I want to say it anyway, because it's part of what inspires me so much to do this work is clearly your journey of healing from cancer was part of the catalyst to awaken you to your soul's purpose to help others know that healing is possible. And it's worth it, isn't it, to go through hell yeah. to come out the other side. And, and to, uh, the way I imagine myself when I work with ayahuasca is I have a hat with a light on. <laughs> 
and I'm in the maze, the dark tunnel with everyone else. But I'm like, come on, you guys, like there's light, let's follow it. Let's figure our, our way through, you know? And yeah. that's only because I've gone on my own healing journey and I know that it's possible. So yeah. it's, it's worth it to go through hell to know that we can help others do the same. And yeah, I just wanted to honor that, you know, and the work Thank that you're you. doing now, paying it forward. Yeah. Um, let's see, question. Is your work with the mushrooms typically by yourself or do you typically have a human guide? Like, do you think it's be better to do work ourselves or to trust somebody to hold space? Again, I think that's incredibly a personal decision um, because for me personally, I did it alone. Um, I needed that space by myself. I just needed the, um, you know, everything that it brought me was something that I needed to work through by myself and that I didn't feel comfortable sharing with anybody else. Um, in fact, this is the first time I'm really sharing my story. I was telling Kat earlier. Um, and, you know, it, it, for some people, they need to feel that tribe. They need to feel that support and they need to feel that love from other people that have been through the same thing. And that's incredibly important. Either way um, is right, if that makes sense, you know? Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yes. And, and so we also have a question you and I were talking about this before the webinar. So I'm glad this is coming in is there's, um, there's a wonderful problem that we have these days is that we have a lot of choices. So there's one side, the clinical world is coming forth mm -hmm. with usually almost always synthetic psilocybin. Um, in a, you know, a controlled setting with headphones and like, you know, this whole sort of formula. And then, of course, there's the more shamanic way of which is really hard to define because everybody does it differently in terms of like how to create a ceremony, essentially. Um, like, first of all, what's your feeling on synthetic psilocybin versus the organically natural made version? <laughs> Well, my opinion is that nature is always king, you know, nature always knows best and um, people do the best they can to replicate it. And so, um, like we were saying earlier, I don't ever want to say, you know, you definitely should not do this. And, um, you know, the medicinal or the medical version of psilocybin, um, it, to me, it, it's just not quite the same and it's not ever going to be quite the same because there's chemical compounds in the mushrooms that all work together as a whole to heal it's um, not just the psilocybin yeah exactly yeah. you know it's the same thing as for example like eating whole foods as opposed to just taking a vitamin you know the whole food itself is going to be better for you it's going to be healthier it's going to work in different ways with your body because that food was chemically you know made together to work with parts of your body to heal as opposed to you know you take a vitamin yes it's good but it's not going to be as good right not the same yeah, good point. Yeah. 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 And so so for me, when people ask me that question, my answer is always whatever makes us feel most safe, first and yeah. foremost, you know, if and some people feel safer in a clinical setting. Um, the only thing that that uh, I know hurts me about that set and setting <laughs> is that quite often, I would say probably most often, the person administering the medicine has never actually worked with psilocybin, doesn't know the power and the sacredness of the medicine itself. And so there's a disconnect, you know, I don't, I personally don't know how to feel safe receiving a sacrament from someone who doesn't know what the personality and consciousness of the sacrament feels like. But then again, that's just me. If someone were to say, I feel safe right. with a doctor in a, in a clinical setting that can administer this and I don't care if they've ever taken it, well, then that's what matters. That's this personal right. journey is what is true right. for us. You and I are gonna go to nature, but it doesn't have to be that <laughs> right. way. It's really whatever works, whatever resonates, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to add on that? Like just the clinical versus natural or like just discovering what um, is safe for you? Yes, I guess one other little aspect of it that, you know, that you mentioned the set and setting. Um, for me personally, I think, you know, nature is the perfect set and setting. You don't have to replicate anything. You don't have to um, surround yourself with all of these cozy things. Like to me, set and setting would be sitting on the edge of a cliff watching the stars come up, you know? And um, I feel like um, your experience would be incredibly different 
and not necessarily better or worse, but incredibly different um, than if you're in a clinical setting. And um, one interesting thing that there has been done a little bit of research now that things are, you know, picking up a little bit in that area. Um, and according to whatever the research that has been done, the people that have their experiences out in nature, as opposed to in a clinical environment, have reportedly said that their experiences not only last longer in a healing way, um, but are one of the most remarkable experiences of their life, as opposed to something that they, you know, were was helpful, but it wasn't like, wow, this is life changing, you know. Um, so I just found That's that fascinating. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. I did find. That I love that the research is starting to catch up and to show us and sort of yes. validate from a scientific lens that this instinct of, of course, you know, of course, it would be more profound in a natural mm -hmm. setting, but yeah, that science can back that up and to validate it. That's really beautiful. No? Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, my medicine and one of them is ayahuasca. And there's some differences, the fundamental differences in how we view working with mushrooms versus ayahuasca, because for example, um, I would never advocate anybody work with Aya solo without tons of training, mm -hmm. but the mushrooms mm -hmm. are different. <laughs> and somebody asked yeah. me the other day, why do I think that is? I want to run this by you, see what you think. It's like, well, first of all, I think that nature shows us a lot about the medicine based on how the plants themselves grow, how they show up in nature. And mushrooms, they barely poke the surface typically, and they have a deep root structure, but they're very grounded, right? They're very mm -hmm. earth connected, which means even when you're having a super cosmic experience with them, they're also really body connected. I mean, that's mm -hmm. my experience with them. They're embodied, but they're expansive. That I think is one of the reasons why they're safer to work with in, in a solo setting is because they mm -hmm. just have this built-in groundedness like even if it's a, I've had some pretty intense experiences with them <laughs> where I had to work really hard to stay grounded, but right. uh, it's a different vibration than I have. But I'm curious your thoughts, like, cause they seem to break the rules. They seem to break the rules in terms of all the contraindications. Like oh, there's so many rules with Aya you have to follow with Wachuma of like, you can't be on this, you can't be on that. Mushrooms are like, come as you are, much more, not across the board, but much more. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, you pretty much covered it really is I do believe that, <laughs> you know, um, I think that they are much more grounding. Um, and I feel like you have a little bit more control over um, how, how big of an experience you want to have. Like, I feel like maybe Aya is a little bit more like, you go into it and you, you <laughs> don't know, you can't predict, right? You, um, with mushrooms that you can't predict either, you know, but you can take a smaller or a larger amount based on, you know, where you, where your comfort levels are, um, how grounded you want to feel and how ungrounded you want to feel. So you have a little bit more of a, of a personal choice with it, I suppose, um, at least from my experience with that. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm really, you know, they kind of just do their own thing. <laughs> And there's so many different types of mushrooms that I feel like, um, you know, there are certain ones that give you different experiences too. So some, you know, will make you very giggly and uh, find like really happy things in life. Some are very visual, some are very meditative and calming. And so there's a whole bunch of different types of experiences you can have with these mushrooms um, based on your needs really, you know? And do you find that, um, you know, like the microdosing protocols that Paul and James Fadiman and people like that have made really popular, do you find those to be equally profound in the potentiality for healing that, or does it have to be a big old journey? So uh, that's an interesting question because I do feel like the microdosing does serve its purpose, but in a way, I feel like that is easier to abuse. Really, I, I don't know if that's the right word, Good but word. It's, it's easier to just pop them and be like, all right, fix it for me, as opposed to, you know, you go in with these bigger experiences, you're going in with the mindset of reverence and like a, a purpose, a focus in, in place of what you want to get out of the experience. You can't really like pinpoint exactly what you know, what you want 
because the mushrooms kind of take over at that point and show you what needs to be shown. But you do go in with a purpose. And so I feel like your your journey can be a lot more profound and a lot more long lasting. Um, you'll look back on that experience and be like, wow, for the rest of your life, that was something life changing as opposed to microdosing, you don't notice the, the changes that it's making. And sometimes when you don't notice the changes that are being made, it allows you to um, not pay attention. You know, it, you know what I mean? You kind of just, it, it takes the focus off of you and your inner journey again. And just, you're, you're relying on something external to fix you. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. I mean, I think that's why in part we're having a, you know, a, I'll call it a plant medicine revolution, <laughs> although some call it a psychedelic revolution. Plant medicine <laughs> revolution is because most of us in the Western world are so deeply programmed around all these limitations. We need a big old divine smack upside the head. <laughs> and that's what they provide. I can honestly say, you know, it's speculation, but it still feels true that if I had discovered microdosing before having big journeys with medicines like ayahuasca, I wouldn't be where I am today because I needed, mm. you know, a, a smack upside the head. Now that I have mm. the conscious relationship with nature in that way, microdosing is very powerful, but yes. there's something really valid to what you're saying. We need to be like, wake up. You know, like right, just right. To, to see I mean, things in a dramatic shift sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. And then you're doing yeah. the microdosing consciously as opposed to just, you know, just a, exactly. a thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So, oh, interesting question from Renee. We were talking about essentially the classification of clinical and spiritual or shamanic. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, she, she was asking, what about bridging the clinical and the spiritual? You know, like, is there anything in your awareness where there's, um, there's a mixture happening? I mean, I'm sure there is. That's a great question is, can we put the two together? I mean, I imagine you can, you can do whatever you like, really. <laughs> right. <laughs> whatever floats your boat and feels right for you. You know, um, for me personally, I've not done any of the clinical journeys, so I, I can't speak for it. Um, or against it, you know, um, I, that just goes down to what you feel most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that bridge is happening because I have coaching clients myself that are in the clinical world that are coming to me asking questions about how do I create a sense of spiritual safety for my clients, like really mm -hmm. wanting to bring in shamanic perspectives. That, that excites me the most because if we could all just come to the table knowing that all perspectives are valid and we all have wisdom and we could learn from each other, this world would be very different instead of saying Absolutely. clinical versus shamanic. It's like, but the, the clinical world isn't quite, at least on a large scale, welcoming the wisdom of the shamanic or natural perspective. And so right, for now that's right. still underground, you know, but right. that's, it's a, it's a fantastic goal is to just Hopefully have it one be day. merged. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully yeah. one day. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Evolution. Um, so mm -hmm. we have another question about, uh, she's asking, is ayahuasca most often done at night, which it is, but that brings me to a question around mushrooms and who they are <laughs> as beings in, in your relationship with them. Do they like the daytime? Do they like the nighttime? Do they, is there anything, like with ayahuasca, we do it as a meditation at night most often. Is there anything that they were, or, or are they like a yes to everything? <laughs> So in my experience, it's a yes to everything, but at different times. Um, so it was, you know, going with my intuition of how I felt was going to be most healing for me that day, you know, and in some cases that was going out to the beach in the sunshine and watching the waves and, you know, um, experiencing all of the sounds of the animals and things like that. And just taking like that quiet time in the beautiful sunshine and, feeling all of the warmth that comes from that. And then, and other times I felt that it was more necessary to go inward into the dark and the cool and to have candles lit and just a very quiet, peaceful environment, you know, in that way. And so I, I can't really determine what made me go one way or the other. It was just, you know, however I felt at that moment. Um, and it's interesting, you know, you don't, this isn't something you just do all the time um, either. It, it's, that's one of the beautiful things about mushrooms is that you can have an experience, experience um, you know, a, a couple times a year 
even maybe even less, you know, you might just need one in your whole life. And it was, it's enough to change your perspective for you or give you what you need in your healing process. It's not something that you need to do every single day. And so um, every experience with it is very, very different. Um, and just is very, very relevant to whatever is going on in your life at the moment. There's a similarity in your answers that there has to be this element of self-discovery and inquiry mm -hmm. regarding, you yeah. know, what the answer is. This, and and mm -hmm. mushrooms in particular, they're such um, they're such allies for empowering us to trust ourselves. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so to do that introspection of okay, I feel really called to work with them in what set and setting, because there's no right or wrong, you know, and, and to be empowered in finding that. Yeah. And so to really beautiful. trust your gut, you know, um, there's one little bit of research that's, you know, a scientific fact or whatever that's really, I found very interesting as the serotonin receptors that are in your brain are also found in your gut. So as you know, it's literally quite literally a second brain, you know, and so you really need to learn to trust this gut and mushrooms are a wonderful tool to be able to do that. So I just thought that was kind of neat. <laughs> You know, when I first started working with them many years ago, I had a very hard time digesting them. And I think it's because I didn't trust my gut. There was all this mm -hmm. blockage, this like um, disconnection from intuition. And I know that's fairly common when people work with actually mushrooms mm -hmm. of all varieties, you know, mm -hmm. like they can be hard to digest, but I always like to oh, reflect yeah. because we're not connected. There's so much there that hasn't been digested and they come in and help us to start alchemizing it. But yeah. they were part of the the beings that helped me to start learning to trust. Like, ooh, there's mm -hmm. there's wisdom in there. Yeah. And the more yeah. that I trust my gut, the less it hurts when I digest them. Like, ah, oh, you know, like I'm in right? flow with it. <laughs> very, Might very be something there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of people are asking for for advice on where to get them, which we can't give from a perspective yeah. of the psilocybin because we live in a world that well, you could come to Denver because I live in Denver and it's legal here exactly. for personal use. But but do you have any suggestions for the non psychotropic like, like mushroom world that we can suggest like the like brands or any places that you go and you trust the the you know the efficacy and the potency of the the organic medicines yes so um my advice would be to find somebody that grows them organically nearby you because there are people you know so that like make that your first mushroom step people if you can, <laughs> right find your mushroom people because they are out there um and so me personally, I grow them myself. Um, and so I have my little rotted logs, but I've got turkey tail and all of this fun stuff, you know. And, you grow them uh, all. Amazing. I do, you know. And so for me, that's therapeutic in its own way, you know, just to know that it's like, it's something that you're putting the work into on a physical level also. And so I just find that an extra layer of uh, therapy for me. But yeah. um, as as far as like, you know, if you just want to go find something store bought, um, Ohm is a great brand that I have used before and I enjoy. Um, and also, um, what is it called? It is called Hold on, I'm gonna go look at it really quickly. Okay. <laughs> and while you're doing that, I want to address something I see in, in chat around the topic of microdosing. Okay, first, yeah. go ahead, show it. Yes. It's ancient apothecary um, is a ah, wonderful, okay. yes, is a wonderful brand. Um, and that's actually the first brand that I started with the turkey tail. Um, and they do like a fermentation process with the mushrooms that makes them a little bit extra potent and ashwagandha is added to them as well. Um, so that's a really great brand. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, yes. Back to quickly the subject with microdosing. I'm gonna make it clear to everybody, we are not negative on microdosing. I think what yeah. Jenny's bringing in, and I really resonate with this, is when we work with any aspect of nature, it is a relationship that we are cultivating. Most of us are trained to take supplements unconsciously. We pop them and then we forget it. And I'm not saying that doesn't have some potential for healing, but if you really wanna maximize the opportunity for the medicine that you're working with when it's conscious from nature to co-create some magic, there has to be a relationship. You know, taking the time to sit and connect, be clear on intention, to feel the vibration, the consciousness of the plant. And when, when we microdose without having, you know, a big experience of that consciousness, we might not even know 
what is possible. You know, we're treating it like a vitamin. And like you said, it's it, exactly. that's not bad. It just doesn't unlock the potential. So if you're trying exactly. to heal something major and you're doing it unconsciously by popping a pill, it's unlikely. No, is that fair to say? I just wanted that's, to be clear yeah. on that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying it doesn't work exactly like you said, you know, um, but it works a lot better if you're putting the conscious effort into it. And, and also, you know, like knowing what you want to get out of it, as opposed to just popping the popping the thing and being on with your day, you know? <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, it's, it's, since I emphasize it as a relationship, the other thing I want to say about that is it also, there needs to be baked in some amount of reciprocity, like, you grow your own mm -hmm. mushrooms, you cultivate yeah. them, you love them, you create an environment where they can flourish. Like that is the truest like expression of reciprocity or what of them. Because if we keep going to nature, just taking and taking and taking, not only will there be nothing left, but we're missing out on the, the incredible sacred opportunity to give back. So my invitation to all of us, I'm always trying to up my game in this regard, is to always be curious of how we can give back to these beings that we are asking to save our lives, to heal the most dramatic trauma, like these, to tell mm -hmm. us the secrets of the universe. These are the biggest things we could ask for, to also treat them as conscious beings that we want to give back to and to be curious about. Because Absolutely. Don't know, yeah. Yeah. Um, an interesting thing that said for anybody that is curious about giving back with their growing up mushrooms, um, Amadou is an amazing mushroom for your immune system. Um, it's not psychoactive. It's just a regular medicinal mushroom. Um, so it's all good to grow anywhere you are. Um, but it's also uh, one of the leading mushrooms that helps the bees at the moment um, for all of the research that has been done. Um, the bees actually ingest this mushroom and it helps their immune system defense. Um, so it's really fascinating research if you want to Google all that and kind of get into a little bit more. But speaking of reciprocity, you know, um, the bees are our life, you know, and the planet really. And so if you want to help give back to them, grow a little Amadou for them. <laughs> I love that. And, and while we're on the topic, are there any other lesser known, psychotropic or not, mushrooms like Amadou that you want to make people aware of? Hmm, let me Because we know lion's well, <laughs> mane and cordyceps, you know, right, the, the usual right. suspects. Right. Well, that, that one is the main one that I know the research on at the moment um, to be able to give, you know, advice of like, yes, this one is amazing and awesome. Um, shiitake is also really awesome. Uh, and a lot of people kind of take that for granted. Because um, it's culinary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and some yeah. of these culinary mushrooms uh, really do have some amazing benefits. Um, shiitake is great for your skin, your hair, your nails, um, brain development, that kind of thing. So it's, it's interesting to know all of these things. Um, and along alongside the topic of brain development, um, lion's mane um, is a really, really amazing mushroom. And uh, there's been studies done proving that it slows down the progression of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just think that that's a really powerful tool. Why not? You know, and it's readily available um, out there. So put it in everything. <laughs> Be good to your brains, you know? <laughs> it's my personal favorite because because yes. Alzheimer's runs in my family and, and I'm okay. well aware of that. And I'm madly in yeah. love with the vibration of this mushroom because I feel the cognitive effects, the expansiveness, the fluidity, just the healthy way that it helps me relate to my mind. And it's also mm -hmm. been the, the mushroom that helped me a long time ago not feel afraid anymore of the fact that Alzheimer's is in my lineage. I no longer feel doomed to repeat that because it's kind of like what you were describing, the mushrooms giving you that expansive of like, I can do this, I can heal. It's like the fear is not in me anymore. So love lion's mane. Yeah. I love that you made a point to say that with you know a, a regular medicinal mushroom as opposed to the psychoactive. Like it doesn't always have to be a big hallucinogenic trip to give you back your power. You know, the mushrooms offer all different kinds of mushrooms offer all different kinds of healing and strength for us. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So Kathy is asking if you'd be willing to share um, a particular journey that was difficult. And, and I want to frame it in terms of like 
helping us to feel empowered to deal with the challenging aspects of, of doing journeys. Like, do you have any tools, any advice for how to, because it's inevitable, right? They're going to take yeah. us into our shadows, at, either physically, <laughs> emotionally, spiritually. How do you navigate that personally, deal with those challenging times? So personally, um, what has worked for me, because I do my experiences and have done my experiences in the past by myself, um, writing has been something that I find incredibly helpful to get the most out of both positive and negative experiences, because, you know, sometimes so much is happening in the experience that at the end of it, you can kind of like forget all of the amazing things that happened. Right. And Which has so, happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, um, I actually, I have, um, like an artist book that's, you know, it's not lined paper because sometimes I just feel like drawing. Sometimes I feel like writing and scribbling just whatever is on my mind. Um, and some of it, you know, is very, very dark and some of it, it's interesting to look at because the colors that you choose will be different depending on what you're flowing through in the moment. And you, so when you look at it the next day, you'll watch this really, really dark place turn into all of a sudden, all of these bright, beautiful colors and all of these lovely drawings. And you know what I mean? And so you can actually visually watch your progression um, as you go through your process. Um, so anyway, for me, that works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it helps I ground you too. That. It helps ground you when you're, when you're kind of like, when you need your moment of grounding and you're like kind of losing touch. And if you're starting to feel that you're having a bad experience, um, you know, you can just start writing and it gives you something to focus on that brings you back to the present moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And gives you an opportunity to express and to, it's another, yes. you know, in ayahuasca, we do a lot of purging. This is a way to kind mm -hmm. of purge in a, you know, yeah. in a creative it's way of what's in us. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, people are asking if you could spell the, uh, Amadou, the, that. Yes. Yes, of course. It's A-M-A-D-O-U. D O U. I believe. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> somebody got it in it. chat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, we've covered all of the questions. Um, at least I think I tried to catch them all. If I missed anything, please throw it in there again. Any last words around how, what you want to say about the, the gift of getting to be in relationship with mushrooms, who they are to you, who they are as healers? Like anything you want to say? Oh, I just feel like, um, you know, these things are such a powerful tool um, and a doorway really is how I like to describe it. A doorway to looking into yourself. And there are so many, so many healing options. Um, once you start peeking through the doorway of some things that you didn't even maybe realize needed to be healed or worked on. Um, they're incredibly insightful and grounding and beautiful um and it just puts you in a place of power and a place of healing in your own in your own little world <laughs> i don't know how else to describe it right beautifully said beautifully said <laughs> and somebody has just asked too um are, are you aware of any like retreats that are in safe legal settings that work with mushrooms in a ceremonial way no, because they don't have um, the same like lineages that are readily available. Right. I, I don't know. I mean, I know they exist. I just don't have a relationship with them. Right. And same. Um, I, I don't actually know anything to be able to offer that um, on my part, because like I said, my work is done by myself. So I've not really done a whole lot of searching on my part um, to find something like that. But I know that they're out there, you know, um, it's just I, I recommend, I guess, if you're if you're looking into something like that, do your re research on the place and the people who are involved um, to make sure Always. that it's a safe to make sure it's in safe an environment for you. You know, um, it's it's just personal, really. Yeah, you're gonna have to do a little bit of research on that for yourself to figure out if it's gonna suit exactly what you have in mind. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, any advice on people that want to start the process of growing mushrooms, mushrooms of all kinds, we don't have to limit it, but do you have any <laughs> research? Because lots of people are interested in the reciprocity of like growing, growing these, these beautiful beings. Yes. 
Yes. YouTube is your best friend. Like, honestly, if you're, you know, if you can find absolutely anything there that you feel like. Um, and also a lot of the YouTube videos that instruct you of like the basics of starting the growing and all of that will also have links to where you can find things. Um, you know, for example, like there's a place in um, Oregon that sells the logs already prepped, uh, ready to go with turkey tail. And so if you're just starting out and you're just kind of a hobbyist with it and you just you want to see how it goes for you, ordering something that's already like pre-made like that and seeing how it turns out for you is kind of fun. And it's a great way to learn um, of, you know, how, how you make it work for yourself. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think one of the important things when we embark on uh, becoming growers is to give ourselves permission to not get it right out of the gate. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's there okay. Will be failures. <laughs> yes. But it's Plants not really a failure, right? Yeah. Mushrooms it's not really are yeah. failure. It's and not. It's not. Look at because it as an they, experiment, right? <laughs> yeah. They know they're just dying to be reborn again, especially mushrooms. Yes. They're alchemists. This exactly. is what they do for the forest. And so I think some of us, well, I'll speak for myself. I used to be very afraid to embark on those sorts of things because I, I don't want to kill things. We're going to. Yes. It's okay. Like, yeah. And it's part of the learning process. So to give ourselves that permission. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And if you think about it, you know, if you, if nobody buys the logs with them already growing, they're going to die anyway. So at least you're giving it a chance. <laughs> Excellent point. Right. <laughs> to have some sort of life. Excellent point. Right. Um, Jenny, I love you so much. Like, thank you for this. Um, I want to make people aware of your presence on the Plant Medicine People site. You're a coach to help people do all of the things we were talking about today mm -hmm. to just navigate this very personal experience of the healing journey. Um, so if anybody wants to get in touch with her or to work with her, uh, just click on coaches at Plant Medicine People. We're so honored to have you in our tribe. You have so much expertise. We just scratched the surface today. But thank you especially for being personal about your journey because it's so inspiring. And yet I know it's like it's a lot to share because it's so incredibly tender. But we so appreciate your transparency because I know you're going to help a lot of people. Absolutely. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, honestly, it was a little bit healing for me to finally share it. <laughs> yeah. Bless you. Anytime. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about mushies anytime. You're amazing. Absolutely. You're amazing. <laughs> all right. And thank you to all of you who came and showed up and asked such beautiful questions. Um, yeah, we just love having the opportunity to talk about these things and inspire people to know that healing is possible. And the plants are freaking amazing, like very simply. It's just, it's our favorite mm -hmm. thing. So thank you all for being a part of that and for doing the work out there. We love you, appreciate you. Um, in two weeks, the next webinar is gonna be about uh, deepening, cultivating a relationship with cannabis. We had part one a few weeks ago, a month ago. So we're gonna continue that discussion of how to cultivate that sacred relationship with one of the most mysterious plants there is. So. See you in a couple of weeks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Bye, sweetheart. <laughs>